Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Well, we welcome not only you uh, back to the last chapel of the week, but also our speaker, Dr. Doug McConnell, uh, to speak to us for the last time. And these have been very powerful messages relative to children and the mission of God. Uh, and we've been looking at uh, the basis of the value and uh, the supreme love of the Lord Jesus Christ for children and what those implications are for our ministry, all the way through to the sad abuse that occurs in many of their lives, many hundreds of thousands of their lives, and what we can do about that. So we, I've appreciated, I know that we all have appreciated the, the very vibrant and uh, dynamic challenges that we've had this week in this chapel. And uh, we all appreciate very much that Dr. McConnell has shared a whole week. He's the provost of, uh, of Fuller Theological Seminary, has been the dean of their School of Intercultural Studies. And uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty big task. And so to take a week out of it and to share it with us has been wonderful. And so many of us have appreciated him in class and uh, in other meetings around campus, and now for our last session together. So let's, uh, let's give uh, Dr. McConnell a, a, a good round of applause and thanks, and welcome back to the pulpit, and may God bless you richly in your continued ministry. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. It's good to see you all this morning, and I think my president, who has a reformed view of theology would be pleased to see that there is such a thing as perseverance of the saints in this uh, Friday congregation. So it is good to see you all, and thank you for being here this morning. It's a privilege to be able to share. In fact, I have to, I have to confess that I think I've enjoyed this series of chapel addresses more than any I've given in the last four or five years. So it's been great. I'll have to go back and tune up our folks at Fuller. So <laughs> we don't have a trumpet player, so that's what, that's what we need. I didn't pick that hymn knowing that Chaplain Bill was going to play that trumpet, but it worked out well, didn't he? I wish I'd have picked Crown Him with Many Crowns. I blew it. I could have had that. So anyway, it's good to be with you. My first experience um, of encountering the HIV AIDS pandemic was in Imbarara, which is a small town in Uganda down near the border of Tanzania and Rwanda. I was there supervising a, a, a research project that was going on um, in Kampala and up in the northern part of Uganda, um, uh, and it was, it was just an opportunity. I had to go see a friend of mine who was the Scripture Union director. So I went down on the bus, and, uh, and it, that was a trip. I mean, if you've never been on a bus on a road in Uganda, you haven't been on a bus. I mean, uh, our pilots in America have nothing on those bus drivers, I'm telling you, they were really going for it. But anyway, I got there in one piece, which was good. Uh, coming back, I questioned whether that would happen, but I, I obviously did get back. But anyway, when I got down there, I, uh, I went, was asked to go to the hospital, and so I went to the hospital and uh, into the ward where um, they were caring for those who were dying. Now, in, that, in those days, they, they called HIV AIDS slim, and the reason was because you just lost so much weight. Generally, the AIDS um, virus began to deteriorate your immune systems and other things, and so you contracted tuberculosis and, and pneumonia and other things like that, so you just sloughed off weight. And it was really, it looked like, it looked like being in a morgue. It's just that the corpses were breathing. It was just incredible to, to see that. And it's one thing to see that. It's one thing to see it in the adult population, but I, I left there and I was asked to go visit a home of a young accountant who uh, lived in the city and so in the town. So we went over to his house and I got to the front fence and there was a little picket fence in the front and uh, there was an older man at the gate and behind him was a little boy that was kind of peeking around his leg. You know how kids will do. And this was grandpa. And so grandson was peeking around his leg. And when I got up there, grandpa said, do you love my Jesus? I don't get greeted that way very often. And, you know, what do you say? Of course you, yes! And then you whip out three points and do a sermon. You know, I, that's a real invitation. I said, yes, I do love your Jesus. I love my Jesus. And he said, good, come in. So I went in, and I walked into the front room of, of the small house, and there on the couch was a young man, probably 33, four years old. Um, and he had AIDS, and he was in the last stages of life. I, I mean, he was barely, barely making it. 
And so I, I bent down on my knees next to his head so that I could hear him. He wanted to talk to me. He had gone through scripture union. He had gone through uh, inner varsity and university at, uh, at, at uh, McCrary University in, in Kampala. He had starred in his academic pursuits. He was an accountant. He was hired by an international accounting firm. He had a good job in the city, but it was hard for the family. He had a young wife, and so instead of having her stay in the city, he put her back in their family home in Imbarara, which was three, maybe four hours bus ride. So he would stay from Monday to Friday, and, and then on the weekend, he'd, he'd go home. It went okay for a while. He got involved in the local church, but you know, business, you know, you gotta go out and have meetings, and, and there are gonna be mixed meetings. There's gonna be men there and women there, and then pretty soon, you know, wife's far away, and the next thing you know, he was involved in illicit relationships. He contracted AIDS, and he took it home and he gave it to his faithful wife. There is a feminization of HIV AIDS pandemic going on in the world today, whether it's in the minority populations of some countries or the majority populations in the continent of Africa. So as he started to talk, he started to cry. And he said to me, I feel like that I have sinned against God, I have sinned against my wife who is dead. She had died the year before and now I am facing death myself and my heart is broken and I'm leaving behind my little boy. And that little four-year-old boy had lost his mama and he was just about to lose his daddy. And I looked again in the face of the grandpa that loves Jesus and I started to think about that. And I said to myself, how long is that guy gonna last? That's one thing for us to last 75, 80, 85, 90, even 98. My, grand, my wife's grandparents are 98 and, and they're going fine. But it's a whole different thing to live in that environment where they are living and make those years. So that little boy was just about to be cast into the hands of his grandfather and I would, have doubt, I would doubt seriously that that grandfather is alive today. There are over 12 million orphans on the continent of Africa alone. In many of the countries, in about 20 different countries, the percentage of AIDS orphans to total population of children is as high as 25%. Now that's a very sobering reality. And when we start talking about children, that's a reality that most of us don't want to embrace. We don't want to lean into that. In fact, if you start looking around our world, when you talk about children, it is not a ministry that proves to be immediately successful. It's not something that you can shine and be a superstar in right away. It's hard, it's long, it will be rewarding at times, and other times it will be so depressing that you won't even wanna be alive yourself. But for some reason, God linked his love in demonstrable ways to the orphans of the world and the marginalized, and I don't know why he did it, except for the fact that it's just like God to do that. The holy God loves his creation, all of his creation, and the holy God made a way by which that creation could be redeemed, and that redeemer came in the person of a baby and grew up and gave his life, and the Jesus that I love is the Jesus that can take those kids into eternity. We heard at Lausanne less than two weeks ago a very stirring message by John Piper, uncharacteristic of John, he's not usually very stirring. Uh, oh, sorry, no, that's not true, he is. He really pounded at home, and one of the things that he pointed out was that we as Christians care about all suffering. Parenthesis, or sorry, comma, especially eternal suffering. And one of the things that I'm really excited about, about your generation, is that you are beginning to understand that the gospel has a transformational impact on the world in which we live. And I, I embrace that. I feel like my generation didn't quite get that as much as we should have. But let me caution you. Because the suffering that you seek to change in this lifetime pales into insignificant in terms of longevity compared to the message of good news that can heal the suffering for eternity. 
the place where no tear will be found, where no sorrow will be found, a place where there is joy. And that good news message goes out to all the world. And you know what? As we've begun to study, we've discovered that children between 4 and 14 are more likely to come to faith than they are later in life. Now, we haven't, I I said the other day, we don't have the empirical evidence to demonstrate that yet, but anecdotally, we haven't refuted it. We're working on it. But the reality is these are human beings created in the image of God who can embrace the kingdom. We saw that. Let the little children come to me, Jesus said. And can not only embrace the kingdom, but can be transformed by the kingdom, and dare I say it, can be part of the missionary message to the world. So often we forget that a child on fire for Jesus has a very powerful testimony. I heard a wonderful testimony from a French businessman once, and he told me about how he came to faith. And I asked him, you know, you know what was it? And he said, well, we had house help in France, and it just so happened that they were Filipino, Filipino house help in France. And it's not uncommon for international house help to go around the world. All you have to do is go to Hong Kong or Singapore and go out on Sunday afternoon and you're going to find a whole bunch of Indonesians or a whole bunch of Filipinas and most of them are house helpers there. And he said, and the mother, the, the house helper was, uh, was a Christian, but, but when it wasn't until she brought her child to live with us and we embraced that that the little child started to ask us why we weren't praying and why we weren't doing things that their mommy did. And the conviction came through, and this man gave his life out of the testimony of a child. And if you go to the Child Evangelism Fellowship website, you're going to get story after story after story like that. And I think all of them are most of them anywhere true. It's just amazing. But the point is, when we look at these catastrophic statistics, and when we come to grips and embrace a world that is not as happy as we thought it was and is more devastated and that that deprivation has just gone rampant through the world, we begin to ask ourselves, is there hope? Is there hope? And I'm here to tell you today there is hope. And the hope is in Jesus. It's interesting, in mission circles today, We're changing the verses that we draw on for our missiological emphasis. We used to use Matthew 28, 18 to 20 all the time, and I love it. I love it. I love the pontata ethne of that verse. I love the fact that we're to make disciples. I love the fact that Jesus will be with us always. I love that passage. But I haven't heard that much as I've traveled around in the last 10 years or so. You know what passage we're hearing at African missionary conferences and at Asian missionary conferences? We're hearing John's Gospel chapter 20. If you want to turn there, I'll read it to you. We're just going to read a couple of verses. Chapter 20, look at verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, then the disciples rejoiced. When they saw the Lord, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And then the passage goes on. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And I'm going to deal with verses 20 and 21, and I'm going to leave verses 22 and 23 to the Johannine scholars in the New Testament department because they're a little problematic. Wonderful, but challenging. Jesus came and revealed himself in a room that was locked because of fear. Now, you you probably don't identify with that very much, although I dare say if you were a child and your parents left you home alone and they went out at night and it was dark, you know what I'm talking about. You know, there are monsters out there. And even for some of us, there were monsters in our bedroom usually under my brother's bed, although I often saw those monsters in the face of my brother, (laughs) which I get in trouble for. But anyway, the point is, they were afraid. There was a fear that was not simply a fear of social embarrassment for holding a contrarian perspective. It was fear of their very lives because the one they loved and walked with and had begun to understand was very God of very God, had died and they were afraid. 
They were afraid for their lives. You saw Peter. He denied that he was a Galilean. Why did he do that? He was afraid. I don't know if any of you have been in situations where you were genuinely afraid, but I have. I've been in locations where a riot was going on and I was caught out in the middle of that and I could have been caught in crossfire. I've been challenged on a number of places in various parts of the world. And that's a frightening experience. One night I was in a, in a, in a city in Chad and there was a civil war that was kind of breaking out or at least some semblance of it and there were bullets flying and we were hiding under tables. That's scary. But these folks were really scared and into that Jesus came bringing peace. That's a picture that people can identify with all over the world. In the midst of my deepest, darkest fears, Jesus comes in and says, peace be with you, shalom. Peace be with you. The idea of, 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 of his presence with you. And then he goes on to say, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And that seems to be the hallmark of the, of the missionary movement that we're seeing coming out of Africa into Europe and North America throughout Africa, from Africa, in Asia, across the Asian continent. We see Chinese taking it with a back to Jerusalem mentality. We see people going out with a kind of, I'm gonna go as Jesus went. Now we used to talk about mission being incarnational and that's a lofty term to give to a lot of what our practices are. So I, I hesitate a little bit. I'm a little reticent to say that I do incarnational ministry or somebody else does because I think if you really understand incarnation, we're just taking a few steps toward it. But nonetheless, there is a kind of a mandated understanding of moving into the world and living out a transformative life in an engagement that allows people to say, why are you that way? What do you believe? And it's at that point that the receptivity for the gospel of Jesus is, 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 is most, or is heightened at its most critical point. People are asking, why? And when they ask why, you've got a reason. And you need to have that ability to speak of that which is within you, that hope that's within you. There is hope in this world. It's hope in Jesus. But a lot of people don't get the categories that we use to communicate it. And so one of the things that we have to start doing when we're looking at these kids is we've got to start touching them where they are. I can remember in the post Ceausescu Romanian period that there were orphanages that were turning up and people were going in and some of those children weren't being touched for a whole day physically. They were so overcrowded that there weren't enough workers to touch the children. I knew a group of older women who went there just to hold kids. Can you imagine raising money for that? We're going on short-term missions to go hold kids. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really ring, but you know, they did. There's a sense in which we've got to go to the kids where they are, and we have a savior that did that, and that's why this passage is so salient for ministry to children at risk globally. Jesus was prepared to go where they were. He was prepared to become a child, and he went to where they were. So when we start to think about that, we start to ask ourselves, wow, this is a powerful, powerful statement. And it isn't just orphans. It isn't just, just children that, are, that, are, that have lost parents. Many, many children have parents who are struggling just to put food on the table. One of the, one of the surest things in American cities in the Southwest is that if you leave children home alone, they're gonna find their way in and be affected by gangs. It just happens. And wave after wave after wave of migrants come into the country. Mom and dad are barely making it, trying to make a living. Kids are growing up, and gangs are picking them up. And we lament that. We lament the immigration problem, but we, we, we lament the whole thing, and we're kind of, in a way, not looking at it very carefully. And this is true around the world. We've got to take these problems from God's perspective. How do we get involved in this? How do we embrace? Now, if we take that background, that our, that our call is to, in a sense, be the hands and feet of Jesus, that we are to, we are to be in that reconciling, that, 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 that incarnational, in as far as we can, ministry, we've got to start saying, how do we do that? And so I wanna finish today with how do you do that? And let me just tell you something. You can forget about me, and, I, and, I, and you know, I, I'm easy to forget, and so you go ahead and forget about me. And you can forget about this chapel, and you can remember it in the long line of amazing chapels that you've had here at Dallas Seminary, but don't, 
don't do this. Don't forget that children are on God's heart because if you do, you're not gonna answer to me. I want this seminary and I want all seminaries to start recognizing that it is part of God's plan for us to touch these marginalized kids. We've gotta get that on our agenda. Whether it's in our understanding of the scriptures, our understanding of our theology, our understanding of our practical ministries, our pastoral ministries, we've gotta get this on board. And this is an important piece. Now it's interesting, at Cape Town, we um, were issued a declaration, and you'll, you'll see this, some, some uh, work has been talked about. It's called the Cape Town Commitment. And the first half of it has been written. Their second half has came out of the conference itself, but the theologians got together and worked on this ahead of time. And what they did was um, they, they put together 10 pieces, and they, they did it from love, from a perspective of love. And the ninth piece was we love the people of God. And I'm just gonna read you two short excerpts from this particular, pass, this particular work. And like I said, we were just given this uh, perhaps two weeks ago. Jesus calls all his disciples together to be one family among the nations, a reconciled fellowship in which all sinful barriers are broken down through his reconciling grace. The church is a community of grace, obedience and love in the communion of the Holy Spirit in which the glorious attributes of God and gracious characteristics of Christ are reflected and God's multicolored wisdom is displayed. As the most vivid present expression of the kingdom of God, the church is the community of the reconciled who no longer live for themselves but for the Savior who loved them and gave himself for them. Amen? Amen. You know, if it were me and I didn't know anything about the church or anything about God and you asked me how I was going to reach the children in the world who were so devastated, I'd say, well, what I'd do is I'd get a community of local people together and I'd make sure that none of them was too arrogant so that they had a birthright that they felt like it was biological. I'd make them all adopted right into that group. And then I'd put them there and I'd give them a strong mandate to reach out and touch the community around them. Does that sound like anything you might know about? That's the church, friends. It is the single best strategy to touch the world. And I'm saying that now not only as one who studies theology, but as a social scientist. If you were to ask me from a perspective of sociology how to do this in terms of feasible groups within social dynamics with appropriate social capital, I would say do it in small little community groups. And I pointed out the other day that in Africa today, they did a study of six countries and they discovered that the number one source of care for AIDS orphans and AIDS victims is small faith-based organizations which translates into congregations. It's an amazing plan of God, an amazing plan. If you get a missional heart, you can see God work in powerful ways outside. But it goes on and this is point C underneath this particular passage. The integrity of our mission. The source of all mission is what God has done in Christ for the redemption of the whole world as revealed in the Bible. Amen? Amen. Our evangelistic task is to make that good news known to all nations. The context of all our mission is the world in which we live, the world of sin, suffering, injustice, and creational disorder into which God sends us to love and serve for Christ's sake. All our mission must therefore reflect the integration of evangelism and committed engagement with the world, both being ordered and driven by the whole biblical revelation of the gospel of God. What an amazing statement, but that kind of integrity. So, here's my, here's my concluding point, and I've got a way to illustrate that. The concluding point is this. How does this play out when we look at children at risk for you? That's my question, and I wanna answer that in the next 10 to 12 minutes, which is a pretty tall order, so I will generalize. First of all, it's important to understand the world that we live in, and let me do that quickly. We have a world that is increasingly becoming young. If you look up there, you have three categories. Industrialized countries, which are the US, the the, the big five in, in uh, Asia and some other countries around the world. And their number of children under 18 years of old, old is about 21%. The developing countries, about 37%. But look at the least developed countries. 49% of the population in the least developed countries are under the age of 18. And 16% are under the age of five. 
Amazing. So what we've got is an opportunity, if you will, a huge opportunity to touch the world, and particularly if we just go down a bit in the number of years that we're looking at to, to children. I want to, I want to introduce you to a group. It's called Viva Network. Some of you may know about it, but not all of you do. Viva Network is a group of people like you that are committed to working with children around the world. You can get to them on their website, which is www.viva.org. They currently work in 43 different community networks in cities around the world, and they're touching roughly over a million children. But it's a group of people that will give you resources, usually information and ideas, and it's a good group to get a hold of. So if you don't know about them yet, they're good people to get in touch with. I've been involved with them now for about 15 years. I'm gonna skip that one. Let's go to the what can you do. Well, first of all, we need to look at a differentiation Sorry, I've skipped too many. Hang on. Oh, well. I need to look at a differentiation. And the differentiation looks at the, that least developed country, the developing country, and the industrialized nations. And I'm not going to look at all of them. I want to look at the bottom number of them. That is the 49%. And you need to know something about those least developed countries. First of all, a least developed country is a country that has low income, Human resource weakness, which means they have problems with nutrition, health, education, and adult literacy, and economic vulnerability. The average, average income per capita, that is the gross national income for, per capita for least developed countries is $995 a year. So that's less than $100 a month. Now just to give you a little bit of a feel for that, I worked in a least developed country and the rent in the city when I was there between 1974, 76 and 1987, the average rent uh, was for a, an apartment or a house between 300 and 700 US dollars per week. Per week. 300 and 700 US dollars per week. Which means that a population where the average wage is 50 cents an hour, can't afford to live in a house. So where do they live? They live in squatter settlements. And those squatter settlements are in every city, in every part of the world. We call them favelas in South America. We call them uh, squatter settlements. We call them all kinds of different things. And they vary. They go from various kinds of places around the world. One of which is one that you need to be thinking about, and that is increasingly in broken down buildings that are abandoned. And the opportunity for these kids is just enormous to touch them. They're there. They're available. They're accessible. And so in least developed countries, there are huge needs and huge opportunities. So now here's what I want to, here's what I want to do. I want to give you some suggestions, and then, and then we'll end up. First of all, if you're going to start down this road, you need to do two things. You need to recognize that you need a, a local ministry and a global ministry. They're calling it glocal now, which is Lynn Sweet's problem. He came up with that. But uh, the idea of local and global. Here's what I suggest locally. I would suggest that you and your church, your local church, and you can do this now as a seminary, research where the children are most vulnerable in your area. So where are the children most vulnerable? The second thing, set in motion a plan to engage missionally from and in your church to the community. In other words, once you figure out what the need is, start putting together a plan of how we can begin to address that. And that can be very simple. One very critical need right now in many parts of the country are for preschools. Poor kids can't afford the tuition for preschools, and the government isn't supplying that. So you've got a lot of kids, three, four, five-year-olds, that have no head start in school, and that kind of a preschool, well, that's something you can do in your church. There are legal ele elements, yes, but you've got wise people in your churches. So that's just one suggestion. Looking at how do we do something from and in our church. And then the third thing, identify mission teams from within your congregation to serve in your community. In your community, mission teams, in your community with these kids. I was speaking this morning in, in, uh, in, in, in the class and we were talking about what could we do in the church. One thing I suggested was if you are 
on your, in your church, if you could get together with teachers in the area, child workers in the area, and kind of see yourself as a kind of pastor networker with that group of people, and begin to ask, what can we do from our church to touch that group of people? You would be surprised how many opportunities there are. I could give you countless examples. I'll give you one. There's a Presbyterian church in Aurora, Illinois, First Presbyterian Church, and the pastor is a particularly good Bible teacher and preacher, at least he was. It's been a few years back since I did the research. But he was, he was drawing a lot of people, and being a Presbyterian church, most of them had a few coins. They were a little well off. So for those of you raising money for missions, hit the Presbyterians really quickly. <laughs> anyway, so they had, they had some money. So they had a good building, and so they were able to buy a gymnasium that was associated with a... Uh, I think with a school, but anyway, it's a, it was a freestanding gymnasium across from their property. And they decided that they would open it up. And at first they opened it up and it was, a, it was a bit hit or miss. Some kids would come and play, mostly kids of the church. But eventually they found out that there were kids that would like to come in at night and play basketball where it was safe because it was an area, there were a lot of gangs, which is true in a lot of parts of our cities. So they started having kids come in and play basketball, and, and initially the church folks really were involved in it, but pretty soon the kids swore, and they'd come in smelling of smoke from various things, and they'd, they'd get fighting and that kind of stuff, and a lot of the church folks just didn't enjoy it very much, which is not necessarily an indictment on them, but that's why I said you've got to get together a mission team from the church. They've got to have some serious commitment. It can't just be, you know, volunteers that are feeling guilty about not doing anything. It needs to be people called to it. So it finally whittled down to a few people that were really called to it, and it really took off when they hired um, a young fellow or they brought a young guy on, on the staff that had been in prison. His back, when his shirt was off, read like a newspaper. It was just the tattoos just could tell you all about everything he'd ever done bad, and, and he'd done a lot of bad. So he used to go around the city, and he had an old beat-up car, and he would get basketballs that were donated, and he would ride on, ride on it, God's Gym, that's what they called it, and underneath it, it would give the address. And he'd go by, and wherever there was a group of kids standing together that looked like a gang, he'd take a basketball and throw it at them. And he'd say, drive by shooting! <laughs> and then he'd drive off. And before too long, more and more and more kids came. Well, it began to grow as a program. And then the interesting thing was that they began to discover that it was the later hours that were more popular, the hours of 11, 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And part of the reason is because kids who weren't, didn't have any place to go could find not only warmth but safety. It was an interesting experiment. And I'm sure that you could come up with dozens of even more creative ways to do it because you've got good minds. You're, you're sitting under some of the best in the business. You can start thinking about these things. That's just locally, okay? Now here's the international. And here's my challenge to you. I would like to see every church that's touched by Dallas Theological Seminary, which is a sizable number of churches, begin to look at the least developed countries in the world. Why not go to where, the, where it's toughest? I mean, you prepare them well, so let's, let's send them there. The toughest place in the world, the least developed countries, Mozambique, Angola, I could go on and on. There's a list of them that you could pick up from, from Rose in, uh, in the missions office here on campus. That group of countries has enormous needs, and they're the ones that are stacking up at 49% under the age of 18, and they're also ones that are devastated, devastated by HIV AIDS. So here's what I suggest. It's a four-step process. First, research the possible partnerships with other churches in those least developed countries. Remember what I talked about when I read the Lausanne statement? That church is a global church. It has Germans, it has French people, it has, it has uh, Burkina Bays, it has Chinese. It's a global church. Think globally. And there will be churches there, doubtless. There may not be one right in the area, but there will be churches in that country, I'm sure. So begin to see yourself not as the answer, but part of the answer. Remember in, when, when we looked at Genesis, and we, or sorry, in Deuteronomy, we looked at Deuteronomy and we said, God was saying, pass this on to your children. God was saying, this generation passes it on to the next generation. And he was talking to the whole nation, all of the people. That same kind of approach comes to us. This is a mission for all of God's people to the world. So think about it not as just First Baptist of Denton, but think about it as whatever church you happen to be with the other churches that are working there too. Why? for two reasons. One is you will have stronger long-term sustainability if you get more people involved in this and particularly if you see it as something that God is doing on a global level. The second reason is, is that you don't know much about that place. 
And we have made countless mistakes that you don't have to make if you get local people to help you not make those mistakes. So there's some real wisdom in this. That's the first thing. Research who are the partners. Secondly, develop a strong partnership of trust with other churches. A strong partnership of trust. How do you do that? First of all, I'd suggest that you exchange pulpits. And that's not just sending your pastor there, but bringing their pastor here. Exchange pulpits. Get to know each other. Get to know the leadership. Have a combined leadership retreat. You say, that's very expensive. Yeah, but how much do you spend on short-term missions? A fair bit. And I'm not criticizing that. Now, I'm simply saying their money is there. And I believe God will supply the money. Another suggestion. Target your short-term mission trips as partnerships. One year, go there with a group from your church. The next year, bring them here. You pay for it, but bring them here. And they can pay what they can. And eventually, it'll, it'll, it'll sort itself out so that you do a partnership with them coming here. So at First Baptist in Denton, Texas, you take your group out and you run a vacation Bible school and half of you are from Angola and half of you are from Texas. The kids would just be blown away and eat weird stuff. You know, do weird things. The kids would love it. So start thinking about it as a genuine partnership because brothers and sisters, we're not doing all that great a job of reaching America. We could use some missionary help and I'll tell you what, if you want to be humbled, you just, you just start working internationally. It'll humble you really quickly. So those are, that's the second step. The third step is this. Provide a sustainable long-term commitment, both financially and in terms of developing leaders. This is critical. You're going to have people in your church that know how to handle money. There are going to be people that know how to earn it and how to invest it. Here's what you need to do. You need to get those minds together, and you need to say, how do we get a long-term, financially sustainable plan? The way schools do it, like Dallas Theological Seminary or Fuller Theological Seminary, is we set up endowments, and we draw down 5% per year. That's one model. It doesn't have to be the only model. But think about how do we sustain this, because kids don't go away after two years. You don't get donor fatigue as a kid. You get malnutrition when donors get fatigued. So you've got to take this really seriously. I'm not talking about second string. I'm talking about your first string. Think about things like scholarships. How are we going to provide? You know what one of the most devastating things the HIV AIDS pandemic is doing is it's stopping a whole generation from going to school. You've got 12-year-olds raising their three, four, five-year-old brother or sister and they had to drop out of school. An entire generation. Do you know what that's going to do to that country with 49% under the age of 18? If 25% of that total population are HIV AIDS orphans, which could in fact be a case or, or much lower, but nonetheless it would be a deep and lasting impact. Brothers and sisters, we've got to get serious about this. So scholarships for schooling. School costs money. Kids need help. Partnership in, in establishing schools. There may not be a school there. Maybe the church needs to become a school. It's happened all over America. We have many models of that, and we've done it well. We know how to do it. That could be something that goes into the partnership. Again, financially, we'll need help. Build a budget for your church that is based on generosity, not removing guilt of affluence. If that sounds like it's harsh, I don't mean it to be. I don't mean to beat you up on that. I do it myself. Sometimes when I'm so moved by the guilt of a Haiti situation, part of that money is just going because I feel bad about it, not just because I want to do development. And I have to catch myself in that. But that's true for a lot of us. Build a budget that's based on generosity. You know, there have been some famous churches, famous churches, like Park Street Church in Boston. At one point, had 50% given to mission. Other churches that I know of, big budgets, and they give a lot to that kind of thing. Well, develop that kind of a generosity in your budget. And finally, provide, or of that third point, finally, provide investments that will generate income. One of the things that we have to do is we have to help brothers and sisters in parts of the world that have not had any financial training or management ability to learn how to do that, and we need to, we need to learn to do that. And some of you are so capable. Some of you are so capable in the finance world. I won't mention any names, but. Uh, but the point is, some of you have enormous skills to bring to this. this we really need it. The fourth thing is this. Remember that a child will grow up as the Lord tarries. You have to get a vision for that child's growth. Don't get a vision for the hungry child. Get a vision for the child growing up. 
in the fear, the worship, and the witness of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we live in a powerfully needy time, but we serve the living Savior. God is God, and Jesus is here to transform the world and to redeem men and women for eternity. That's good news. Amen.